the Tudors. We like the Tudors, the joys of merry England. Under Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth, England underwent its own renaissance, with William Shakespeare setting English culture ablaze at the Globe Theatre. But if you lived then, it was a time of religious turmoil and political terror. And the man responsible for executing the Tudor's ruthless justice is my first worst job, the headsman. Many of the most famous names of the period ended up losing their heads. Anne Boleyn, Thomas More and Sir Walter Raleigh, to name but a few. And of course, the man who did the deed was universally loathed. So, Geoffrey, if you were a Tudor executioner, why on earth would you take a job where everyone hates you? I am just an ordinary member of the Tudor masses. I've taken this job to give me some income, or maybe it is to avoid having to be executed myself. I am nervous. I am unskilled. There's no government training scheme teaching me how to swing an axe starting on cucumbers, working my way up to watermelons. I've got a crowd of 10, 20,000 jeering, cheering Londoners. They revile me, they hate me, because to them I am a symbol of authority. The axe man got hefty tips from aristocrats wanting him to make a swift, clean job. He also got the perks of the victim's clothes, but he paid a high personal price for his grisly work. You are cleaving a person from their body. You are cutting short a human life. And there is no doubt about it, it must have had some effect. Uh, even into later centuries, many uh, executioners, many hangmen are, are in America and this country and elsewhere in France, uh, many of them finished up committing suicide. And the soul-destroying work was made worse by the tools of the trade. The clumsy ceremonial axe worked by crushing rather than cutting. When Mary, Queen of Scots, was beheaded, it took the executioner Simon Bull three blows to decapitate her. Even then, he had to sever the remaining strands of gristle with his slitting knife. With professional standards so low, I was convinced I could do better. Oh, look at that! Slicing through the neck didn't mean the axe man's job was over. Yes. You hold that up. Yeah. And you shout, behold the head of a traitor. Behold the head of a traitor. So die all traitors. So die all traitors. I could really get into this. But remember that with the axe and an execution, you are dealing with a living person, a human being. And presumably the feel of going through flesh and bone would be totally different to the the easy feel of going through pumpkins. Indeed, and don't forget that it doesn't end when the head is severed, because the head then falls onto the board of the scaffold and rolls away, and the body recoils, it jerks backwards, and the blood comes pumping out of the severed neck, because, of course, the heart goes on beating for a certain number, and so the entire boards of the scaffold are saturated with blood. Hang on. I mean, that's not a head, but... That would give you a far better experience of, of what it must be like to cleave flesh rather than a mere piece of fruit. It feels different already. Isn't that weird? It just doesn't feel funny anymore. No, because in your mind, that is a neck bone. Yeah. That is there. Ha! It didn't go all the way through. Quick, give us the knife. Give us the knife. Then hold the head up. I don't want to do it now. <laughs> See? It isn't funny, is it? No, not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. It's tragic. Appallingly tragic. But unbelievably, the job got more disgusting. Traitors' heads were put on spikes. To keep the crows off, the executioner had to parboil the heads first with cumin and salt. Hampton Court Palace, Henry VIII's HQ. The main entrance would have been up the River Thames by barge, and you can imagine what effect this beautiful red brick building would have had on people who saw it for the first time. It was a world of jewels and roughs, 
politics and splendor. That's if you were one of the courtiers. The other inhabitants were an unseen army of servants, and right at the bottom of the Hampton Court heap were the people who worked in the kitchens. The Tudors could eat for England. Records tell us what they ate and when, but experimental archaeologists are now testing out how they cooked and who did what. This is a Tudor kitchen. Now, it looks pretty empty and quiet now, but in Tudor times, it would have been like one of those documentaries about the Dorchester or the Savoy. People rushing around, lots of shouting and swearing and panic. Dinner was served from 10 a.m. So can you imagine what time of the morning they had to get up? I mean, we think of large kitchens being frenetic now, but in Tudor times, how many people would have been working in here? There's got to be 200 people down in these kitchens. Doing what sort of jobs? They're doing everything. You've got 19 departments taking up 55 rooms. There's 12 cooks, each one with about 10 men doing what I'm doing. They're chopping, they're grinding, they're sieving, they're preparing ingredients. All right, it's my first day. You give me a job, it's going to be the lousiest job in the entire Ooh. kitchen. I'm going to put you on the spits. What people now call a spit boy, what the Tudors called a term brooch, I'm going to hand you over to Master Cook to get the spits set up. Being a spit boy wasn't rocket science. Job description, turning the handle. But, of course, he needed something on the spit first. Robin, I'm the new boy. What is it that I put onto the spit? Well, on the spit, we put in beef. That's beef? This is beef. Doesn't look like any cut of beef I've seen in my picture. No, it's not suitable for cooking in the oven. There you go. Mine's a bit floppy. Oh, oh, this is extraordinarily floppy. Yours was nice and stiff. So I just, just shove it on. Yeah, just put it on uh, like uh, sideways round. No, the other way, the other way. This way around, right. That's right, end on. In you go. Hey! Oh. So make sure you don't oh stick God. the spit Come into on. yourself. Come on, that's it, that's lovely. Oh. That's a lovely piece of meat, look at that. These cuts weigh seven kilos. There would have been a hundred, over half a ton of meat being turned by six spit boys. In fact, the spit boys' annual turnover included 1,200 oxen, 8,000 sheep, 2,000 deer, as many pigs, plus wild boar, swans, and even the occasional porpoise. And now the work begins. Would there have been just the one fire in the kitchen? No, there are six. Six? I tell you what, it is flipping hot, isn't it? it certainly is, but it's got to be hot enough to cook the meat. Can I borrow your hat? Yeah, go on. I mean, that's boiling with just one fire. Imagine what it must have been like here. Well, that's the unfortunate byproduct. You are the same distance away from the fire as the meat is, so if the meat gets cooked, so do you. Look, I don't want to be rude, but you're not actually a boy, are you? <laughs> no, uh, I am uh, long past being a boy. But the term spit boy seems to be a derogatory thing. So why didn't boys do it? Uh, they're not physically capable, really. You've put the meat on a spit, you've brought it over here, you've seen how heavy it is, it's not easy to turn around, and children just really can't do it. It is pulling at the arms and back already. It is. But you get used to it. What's the worst thing about this job? Apart from the intolerable heat, it is mind-numbingly boring. How long have you been doing it today? Three and a half hours. Three and a half? What were you thinking about during that time? Apart from, I hope it's finished, can it come off the spit yet? Yeah. Nothing, really. Were there any rules that you had to obey as a spit boy? Yeah, there's a set of, uh, of rules that now survive, which we now call the Eltham Ordinances. And they specify what you can and can't do and uh, must and must not do when you're a spit boy. What sort of things? Uh, for instance, you're not allowed to urinate in the back of the fireplace. I promise I won't do that. It's not going to be a problem. All this heat and you're going to be sweating the moisture out. Um, and the other thing is you could be dressed all the time. No wandering around in just a loincloth. So otherwise, the lads would just have worn virtually nothing. I don't blame them. Well, that seems to be the implication. But if you stand there uh, in just your underwear, then you're going to get burnt very quickly. I'll tell you what, when this gets hot, you're going to get really burnt. You soon, soon learn where that you're in the best position, shielded there by the brickwork from the heat. It's standing out here that uh, you feel the full brunt of it. But this cooking process does work, does it? Oh, it's fantastic. In fact, there are restaurants now that are trying to simulate this in an oven to get the uh, flavour that you get from roasting that you don't get from baking in, a, in an enclosed space. Can I have a go? Yeah, go on then. Oh, let's have a look at this. So these poor spit boys, they would have been 
covered in fat. They would have been yelled at all the time because they were the lowest of the low. They would have been baking hot. I can't tell you the amount of heat that's coming out of here. Their arms would really have been aching. They would have been bored out of their minds. It really was a worse job. But this cooking process is terribly good. And I have to say, this is the first decent experience I think I've had in my entire investigation of the worst jobs of history. Oh, that's good. Yeah, keep turning. Okay. The Spit Boy's chief customer, of course, was Henry VIII. He had a gargantuan appetite and a massive waist to match 52 inches of meat fueled blubber. But what went in had to come out, creating some surprising employment opportunities. I've got a very, very rare piece of furniture here. It's from around 1700, and in the days before the advent of the modern toilet, this was a loo fit for a king. It's called a closed stool, which is where we get our word stool from. A stool is something that you find at the bottom of a stool. And if by any chance you were interested in knowing how the king wiped his bottom, well, he'd actually got someone to sort that sort of thing out for him. He was known as the groom of the stool. And frankly, I'd rather be a spit boy. In Tudor times, the monarch's body was sacred. Only the most aristocratic hands were worthy to disappear beneath the royal buttocks. So the groom of the stool had a lot of power in exchange for his revolting job. Though as a career tactic, it gives a whole new meaning to brown nosing. OK, here's our retiring room, just adjacent to the king's bedchamber. Here's the, uh, the box, which looks rather like something a magician might use, and in a way I suppose it is. Who's going to be the king? Your Majesty. So you do all the rest, right? Yeah, indeed. What you're sitting on now is a modern replica of a box that um, Henry VIII would have used on a daily basis. It's, this stool is, in fact, like one in, in his inventory, 1547 after his death. The million dollar question, do you actually wipe the royal bum? Well, of course, yeah. Yeah, because you're not just a king. You are um, a, a divine uh, body on earth. You are divinely appointed. Therefore, n there's no Tom, Dick or Harry that touches your body. It has to be a trusted nobleman. So this is quite a high status job. Oh, it's the highest job within the royal household. Amongst courtiers, you've got people like the chancellor who are running the country. But within the palaces themselves, the groom of the stool is the most important next to the king. High status, but not that pleasant. Indeed so, yeah. Well, but Henry VIII created this body called the Privy Chamber after 1519, which drew its members from noblemen. So um, I'm one of a privileged few, and, you know, the royal backside is, is you know, all part of the job for me. <laughs> and Henry would have been pretty crotchety, wouldn't he? An increasingly vicious person to be around. Of course, the closer you are to him, in a sense, the more dangerous it was. And Henry Norris, the groom of the stool in the mid-1530s, was implicated in Anne Boleyn's infidelities. So, um, uh, he hit the dirt. I'm going to have all this kit to hand, because although making the bed can be regimented every morning, your bowel movements can't. And, in fact, with other accoutrements, like this, um, this pewter um, little flagon there, and a bowl and plate, all these things are written down in what's called the Baby's Book of Nurture, which is um, a late 15th century book telling you how to take care of noble people. This is how to run a court. So I just give the shout. Yeah. There you are. Indeed. And uh, with, my, with my diaper cloth um, draped over my shoulder. When you say diaper, is that like an American diaper? No. Exactly that. It's because it's woven in two ways. It's extra thick and the diamond pattern is diaper. It's very good, very absorbent for the royal backside. But it was a pretty fat backside, wasn't it? It was. It, it, you were spreading a bit, I think, by the late 1530s. Heavy meat diet. Very heavy indeed, yeah. And do you know what I'd need to do? Probably administer an enema once in a while. An enema? And, um, oh my God! The <laughs> who needs friends when you've got enemas? Um, in 1539, it was reported by Sir Thomas Hennage, the then groom of the stool, that um, the king had had a very fair siege after being administered with laxatives and an enema. A siege? A siege, a passage of, of, of stools. Once I'd finished the day's production, what happened to it? Well, I'll consider it a good job, so to speak. And um, this little fella 
is going to begin its merry journey down toward London. See you. At least the groom only had to clean up after one person. The really rubbish job was having to clean up after the entire royal household. On its journey to the Thames, the King's Stool joined the rest of the sewage in Hampton Court's underground culverts. This is the Hampton Court sewage system, and in Tudor times, this would have been ultra-modern. Two and a half miles of brick-lined culverts to carry away the waste. So far, so good, but remember, in Tudor times, the diet, at least for the rich, was mainly meat. So occasionally you'd get a log jam, and in that case, you called for the gong scourer, or gong farmer, as they were sometimes known, whose main implements were the bucket and shovel, and who could see only by the light of a tallow candle. Gong is an old word for dung. The gong farmer was the person who cleaned it out. They weren't badly paid, but no money on earth would have got me down here in Tudor times. No wonder Queen Elizabeth's gong farmer, Samson, was part paid in brandy. He'd have needed it. But the Hampton Court gong farmers had it easy. Their counterparts in London had to deal with the waste of an exploding population. To get a better idea of the gong farmer's job, I took a trip down the sewers. Today, there are strict safety regulations. Thames Water insists on protective clothing and gas meters to avoid methane explosions. But there are still some backlogs that need to be shoveled out, just like the Tudor gong scourers would have done it. Nowadays, we're not confronted by the problems of our own sewage. We just flush it away and forget all about it. And even down here, it might not be the most beautiful place in the world, but it's big and it's open, there's lots of running water, it all feels pretty much diluted. But in the days before these big brick Victorian sewers were put in, things were very different. A sewer for the Tudors was just a water course. And in London, it would have been the River Fleet, the Thames, or the Town Ditch. And you had privies which were placed over the Town Ditch, for instance. But what you also had was you had, because it was quite a long way to walk in the centre of town, was you had most houses, many houses had privies with cesspits underneath. So how did the gong scourers get into them? You either lifted the seat and went in with your buckets and spades, or if they were more substantial, you broke the side wall open and started taking it out that way. And it'd be two, two layers in there. The top bit would have been semi-solid, it'd be much more liquid and you could have bucketed it out. But after that, you had to go into the much more impacted bottom layer that you literally had to dig out and carry out of the house. So they'd be climbing straight into a great big pile of that stuff? Yes, and it would have sent stench right through the house. And on occasions, the gong scourers and nightmen were actually killed by the stench and the gases coming off this. Did the gong scourer come round at regular intervals, or did you have to go out and find one? You tended to get one when your privy was full, and that might be once a year, maybe once every six months, depending on how big your privy is. How much did you pay them? Again, it depends how big your privy is. What we best way of knowing is looking at accounts of big institutions, and they often had big privies, so they're paying ten shillings. That was a heck of a lot of money. It's a huge it? amount of money, but you've got to remember that when it's being emptied, you've got to pay the gun farmers got a horse to drag the to carry away the pipe that you're putting the waste into. Probably several men doing the work. It's a lengthy and difficult and big operation. It's extraordinary that after all these centuries, they're still shoveling the muck out in virtually the same way that they did in Tudor well, it's, it's, it's When it comes down to it, it had to be hard physical labour. As if the job itself wasn't bad enough, the city slapped a whole load of rules and regulations on the poor old gong farmers, like banning them from living in the city, and ruining their social lives by making them work the night shift. You had to work between nine at night and five in the morning, and there were all kinds of penalties if you spilt or or behaved wrong badly. Uh, what sort of things? 
Well, you could be fined. You find a fair number of fines for them, but also there are really spectacular punishments, a shaming punishment. For instance, there was one guy who had poured waste into the gutters and he was made to stand in the pipe, the container that they poured the cess into, and then it was filled up with waste and he was made to have a sign round his neck saying what he'd done and then he was carted round the city, taken to the edge of the city boundaries and dumped. To be or not to be, that is the question. Shakespeare may have been the greatest writer of the Tudor age, but to get his plays on, he needed a whole load of people whose names are now lost to history. Any actor today would kill to have worked with Shakespeare at the Globe Theatre. Nevertheless, I'm nominating Boy Actor as one of the worst jobs of Tudor times. Being an actor certainly wasn't a glamorous job in those days. For a start, the only place where you were allowed to put on plays was here in Southwark, which at that time was a pretty scummy place to be. On your way into work, you could be mugged by robbers and thieves and cut purses. That is, if you had any money. As far as boy actors were concerned, they were apprentices. They didn't get paid, they just worked for their keep. Actors were part of the scum. Treading the boards was seedy and shameful. Women were banned from the stage by law, so the heroines had to be played by boys and the comic dame roles by men. Here at Shakespeare's Globe, they still are. Peter Shorey is playing the dame figure Mariah in Twelfth Night. Peter? Hello. Hiya. Of course, Tudor boys wouldn't have had a nice dressing room. They'd have had to make themselves up, jostling for elbow room. It was no more than they deserved. Nobody thought actors should be treated well. It's written down in a, in a law in the early 16th century that actors are rogues and vagabonds if they, if they repeatedly perform in unlawful plays all around the country, they could be put in the stocks. If they keep doing it, they could have their ears cut off. They their ears class. cut off? Oh, yes, they could be classed. Uh, with prostitutes, bear baiters, you know, the lowest of the low. Never mind the law, the boy actor was in deadly danger from the makeup. Natalie, what would the makeup have been made out of in those days? Well, the white was um, lead, so yeah. that was very, very poisonous to the, to the skin, and they, they um, often found that pieces of their skin after using it for long periods of time would would fall off or holes and sores appear, which they would then put more makeup on to cover up. What was the other makeup made out of? They had, um, for the red for the lips, it was beetles, crushed beetles. So you had running sores from lead poisoning and you shoved bits of beetle inside that? Yeah, it's a lovely combination. So, and and they, 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 I guess they died quite young mm. compared to how, you know, the ages that people live to nowadays just due to the poisoning. Fancy me? <laughs> a little bit, but not that much. <laughs> well, that's the start. That's the wig and the makeup done, yeah. but the uh, worst is yet to come. Let's go and get into my corset, shall we? <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Walk this way. But I know from experience, what you really dread as a boy actor is the daily grind. You had to work really, really hard. You're always under pressure. No time to learn your lines. You had to stay up late every night, so you're always tired. And if the audience didn't like you, the people in the pit would start chucking fruit and vegetables at you. But for me, the very worst thing would have been that you had to wear a dress. I was a child actor, and when I was in Oliver in the West End, I thought I was really cool. I was about four foot six and I used to wear a Marks and Spencer's car coat with a collar turned up and black shades and a Robin Hood hat. A complete tosser, but I reckon I was dead cool. Can you imagine 12 hours a day as a young adolescent in drag? Being in Tudor drag was also extremely painful. Peter, you've been dead macho while we've been nattering away, but actually you've started flinching now, haven't you? I, I have a little bit. It's getting tighter and, and tighter. It's uh, To get the shape, it's much tighter round here, uh, which means that 
where, that's where an actor usually relies on their breathing to find strength and support. Yeah. And particularly in a theatre this big, you have to have that. So I've got to adjust my breathing to up here and make sure... <laughs> this is really tight. And make sure so give us a long line. Um, right. By my truth, Sir Toby, you must come in earlier tonight. Your cousin, my lady, takes great exceptions to your ill hours. So, diaphragm. <laughs> the stifling costumes were only what most women wore. Petticoats, then an overskirt and corset, then a front piece called a stomacher, and finally the overgarment, often made of thick wool. And keeping all these pieces together were pins, hundreds of them. Even the iconic accessory of Tudor times, the ruff, was kept in place by pins. Round your neck, you could have a staggering 200 of them. So does that mean that there was a really big clothes industry in London? It was a huge industry and a lot of it took place in this part of London and just over the river. What about uh, the, the pins? Side. And the pin industry was, was a large industry as well. Everybody needed pins to dress. We still have an expression that some people might know of having your pin money, yeah. which today means to us having a bit of extra money. But in fact, in 1600, it meant the essential money. You had to have money for pins or you couldn't dress yourself in certain ways, particularly as a woman. So boy actors were walking pin cushions, and no 12-year-old boys that I know could have kept still long enough to avoid constantly stabbing themselves. But actors will go through anything for applause. There were no such compensations, though, for the pin makers, without whom Shakespeare's actors would have ended up in the nude. There were thousands of Tudor pinners, but history leaves little clue about the people who did the job. Most of our evidence about this essential industry comes from archaeology. We found pins from two ends of the market, quality posh pins made by craftsmen and the bog standard pin made by an army of unskilled workers. Pinners worked alongside butchers in areas like Smithfield because bones were an essential tool of the trade. Dr Hazel Forsyth from the Museum of London has formed a theory about how the pinners might have worked from rubbish here outside the city walls. So presumably this would have been the London Wall. Exactly. It's hard to believe that this was such a foul place given how beautiful it is I know, it's there. absolutely lovely. And is there any evidence of pin making associated with London Wall? Well, strangely enough, I had just happened to have a bone in my hand which indicates precisely that thing. As historians do. Let's have a look over do. here. Um, and if you look closely, you can see it's got a label on it saying London Wall. So is this an old Victorian find? Probably. Late 19th century, early 20th century. But it's actually a Tudor thing? Yes. So how do we know that's associated with pin making? Well, because I also happened to be carrying... <laughs> because a mad woman you are, yeah. <laughs> ...another bone. And this is a cow's foot bone, or rather the bone in the lower part of the cow's leg. And what, um, if we compare the two, you can see is that this bone, the pinner's bone, has been adapted from this foot bone by removing these two outer sections, cutting away this part of the bone here, and then turning the bone into various facets and in each of those facets are longitudinal grooves and what happened was that the pinners received their wire, copper wire or brass wire more particularly that was poured through a series of um, drawer plates with diminishing sized circles so they got the gauge of wire that they wanted, slotted the wire into the groove and then once that was held securely they proceeded then to use the file to rub across it. We wanted to put Hazel's theory to the test, so we asked Bodger Hodgson, who makes authentic props for the globe, to recreate the workshop of a London pinner. The whole process was a combination of the unutterably dull and the annoyingly fiddly. The brass wire for pins was cut into short lengths. The head was made by coiling another piece of wire and bashing out one end of the pin. One way of fastening it together was by pressing it under iron blocks, known as cold forging. This is where the bones came in. The pin was put in a groove and filed to a point. The pin makers wouldn't have been able to afford tallow candles, 
So they'd have worked in garrets with south-facing windows in order to eke out the little light that there was so they could work the longest hours possible. If their lives weren't bad enough, King Henry VIII passed a law which said that every single pin had to have the head soldered onto it. This was in order to shut out foreign imports, but it made their work doubly long and doubly dangerous because the solder contained fumes that could give you lung cancer. And how much would you earn from working in this stultifying industry? Well, Bodger reckons that he can make about 20 pins an hour. At that rate, he'd have had to have worked 50 hours a week in order to produce eight pennies worth of pins. And for that, he'd be able to purchase one loaf of bread every day and nothing else besides. The only way you could dye cloth blue or even paint your face blue up till the end of the 16th century when they started to import indigo from India was by using this bright green, highly aggressive weed, which is, believe it or not, woad. And there was a big demand for blue dye in Tudor times. The only problem for the dyers was that the process smelt. I mean, it really stank. How can I describe the vomit-inducing smell of woad? Woad is the stealth bomber of smell. This innocent-looking plant packs a chemical punch that combines the worst elements of rotten cabbage and raw sewage with just a hint of cat's pee. It was a smell so bad that by law, woad dyers had to live outside the city walls. John, the moment that you walk into this room, the niff really <laughs> hits you, doesn't it? But I don't understand it because when you smell the woad, there's nothing, is there? No, right. There's no, no smell to the woad itself, it's the plant. Uh, the, the smell, of course, is all associated with, with, with the process. And the dyes had to process the woad uh, in order to be able to preserve it, to concentrate the dye, and in get, get the dye out, in fact. And this is how they processed That's it? That's right. These are woad balls. and th These were, were imported, in fact, by the thousand in medieval period and Tudor times. Um, and they, they do some, smell, don't they? They do smell, yeah. But the... Um, uh, the best woad came from France, without doubt, doubt, basically because of the hot summers and the dry weather and so on. But uh, having got, got the woad walls like this, the dyers then got to process them. He can't use them just as they are. Yeah. Um, so what he would do would be to break them up with a hammer into a powder, uh, dampen them again, it would ferment again like garden compost, uh, and then after two weeks or so it would dry out. The process of getting the blue dye out of the dried woad involved complex chemistry. Before it was spun, the wool was immersed in a fermented woad solution, hence dyed in the wool. And this is a vat of woad bubbling away? That's right. There are flies buzzing all over it. Get off. It's well, quite disgusting. Uh, that is the case. The, uh, what we find is that the, um, the smell, I'm afraid, is, is uh, uh, even stronger in the case of the actual vat. That's very good. But That's what has happened good. here is we've taken the couch woad, which you've just seen, we put that into the vat, pour boiling water on it, and the indigo comes off like black ink. So we've got a sludge at the bottom and the rest is, is indigo. But the secret was, in fact, to maintain a, 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 a fixed pH in the vat from the beginning to the end. Hang on, they didn't know about pH in those days, They knew did nothing they? about pH. So how did they do it? Well, there were all sorts of, of techniques. Uh, basically, these people had the ability to actually uh, decide on, on the alkalinity of the vat by its feel. Now what happens is that uh, it's like putting your hands into washing soda, it feels slippery. Yeah, it is slippery, mm -hmm. definitely. It yeah. is. Now they could only do this by long experience. So one thing was to, to feel it, another way was to taste it, believe it or not. Uh, and you could taste whether it was in fact um, sharp and, and alkaline or whether it was in fact um, uh, acidic. And the other way, of course, is by the smell. It doesn't taste too bad, actually. It doesn't taste as bad as <laughs> oh, it right. smells. It couldn't taste as bad <laughs> as it smells. <laughs> but the, um, uh, uh, but by, by the smell, we actually know that I've experienced this, that, that the, the, the smell changes with the alkalinity. So if, if it's going, to, going too acid, it changes. And they used to refer to it. When it was, was correct, it would have a mature, a comforting smell. John, I've just realised it does taste bad. It just takes <laughs> a long time. It lingers a bit and gradually. I'll tell you what it tastes like. It's the worst school greens you've ever had in your life. <laughs> well, the, the plant, the woad plant, in fact, is uh, of the same family as the as a crucifer, the same as the cabbage, so there's a similarity there. 
But the, uh, the actual gases that come off from the vat have been analysed and we know they do include those which are given off by sewage. Which is what I've just tasted. <laughs> I think I'm going to forget all about that. So what do we do now? Well, now we're ready to do the dyeing. We take the cloth and we put the cloth in, into, the, into the vat. Yep. And the wool must always be wetted first. This was essential. Otherwise, you wouldn't get, get a proper take up of dye and you'd be putting air into the vat. Mm. In the bottom of it, you can see we've got the thing they used to call a trammel. It's like a chip basket. It's like a chip basket. The idea is to, is to separate the wool from, from the sludge at the bottom. Where's the sludge? Well, I can show you the sludge at the bottom. Here we are. Oh, that is gross. <laughs> That's quite gross. <laughs> That's the wound. Yeah. So anyway, having got the trammel in there, we're now ready. We can put the, the wool in there yep. and uh, we need to leave it for about 20 minutes or so in order to pick up the dye. Right. John, you're a dyer. How would you have been treated in Tudor times? Well, it was a very skilled job, but I'm afraid they didn't have uh, any great standing. Queen Elizabeth hated you, didn't she? Yes, she, she uh, in fact uh, decreed that the, uh, the process mustn't be uh, carried out within five miles of any royal residence or anywhere where she would be going. So you were an outcast, really? Yeah, that's true. Um, basically, of course, this was applied to many trades, and gentlemen, of course, were not involved in trade. Uh, the result is that uh, these jobs would be pushed into the background. And certainly there were lots of complaints about the dyers. They polluted the water, of course. Uh, they were throwing the stuff out into the street when they were finished with it. Uh, and, of course, it was a noxious smell in any case. Right, here we have the cloth. I was disappointed to see a greenish blob, but the dye only works when exposed to oxygen. Oh, Lord, that's extraordinary. It's so quick, isn't it? It is. It's, it's very effective. The Elizabethans must have thought this was a miracle. Well, it was magic, there's no doubt about that. But um, uh, if you look at a medieval tapestry, you'll see that the dominant colour is always the blue. The yellows have gone, the greens have turned to blue, uh, but the blue will be as good as the day they were done. This lasting blue was only achieved at the expense of the stained hands of dyers, who also sweated blue. But these human stiltons were actually pioneers of chemistry. Does the work that chemical dyers do today rest on the kind of things that they were doing in the Middle Ages? I would say so. There's a tradition right through the Victorian period when they were becoming more and more scientific in their handling of natural dyes. But uh, later on, of course, the, the pure synthetic dyes came in. But nevertheless, the, the basic principles are the same even now. And of course, many of the synthetic dyes are in fact copies of the natural dyes. Indigo is an example, of course. Well, these guys mm. might have been innovators, mm. but uh, I'm sure they didn't have very many friends. I should think you'd only ever been able to marry another dyer <laughs> or someone with no nose. I've decided to really put myself through the worst jobs of history. So what was the worst job of Tudor times? Wiping Henry VIII's bottom at least got you to the top of the tree. Woe dying stank, but you were a pioneer of modern chemistry. And even the gory life of the executioner had a weird kind of celebrity. No, for me, the very worst job was being a wife. Not just any sort of wife, a fishwife. Thanks, Joe. In many ways, a fishwife was the most liberated woman of her era because while her husband was away, she had a job of sorts. Fish? Anyone want a nice piece of fish? Being a fishwife was one of the only jobs specifically for women and it had a terrible catch-22 about it. To make a living selling fish, you had to be mouthy, make a noise, get noticed. And women doing that were going to get themselves into trouble in Tudor times because this was an age of religious clampdown. Men made sure women knew their place by writing job specs for housewives. This is the ideal Tudor woman. When thou art up and ready, then first sweep the house. Milk Dress up thy dishboard, feed thy calves, strain up thy milk, take up thy children, and provide for thy husband's breakfast, dinner, to supper, bake and brew with all when need is. Ducks and, and geese to lay, and to gather up their eggs, and when they wax broody, to settle them there as no beasts, swine, or other... So fishwives were on a loser. They had to be loud to do their job, but the Tudors reacted violently to loud women. They punished them as scolds. So I'm going to put myself through those punishments in honour of all the working women who flouted those conventions. 
kind of thing a fishwife was likely to be accused of was slandering her neighbours by calling them things like cut purse, cousiner, copper-faced whoremonger, <laughs> what else? Um, <laughs> Boys out of a pantomime, and then they get really arsy with me and cut me off. <laughs> but the reality was far from pantomime. Breaking the social order was a criminal offence and was met with extreme cruelty even by the standards of the time. People desperately wanted stability. Scolds and fishwives paid the price. Put me down, lads. Thank you, boys of the chorus. What exactly would I have been charged with? Well, you're a scold, and that means... Scold? Me yeah, that means more than just being an annoying, disruptive person. You're somebody who has lowered the reputation of your neighbours, a chiding, brawling person who's actually made them look worse by the things that you've said to them um, in front of their neighbours and in the eyes of the law. So what's the punishment? Well, the punishment is this. This is a scold's bridle. Looks a bit like a chastity belt, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a kind of a, an iron cage which was used in Tudor times, particularly in northern towns and western towns. And this fits over your head like this. Uh, and this bit goes on top of your tongue. Uh, yeah. So oh, when no, that goes uh, on your tongue uh, and you're paraded round in front uh, of your neighbours, oh, yeah, not yeah. only can you actually physically not speak, well, but it's a sign to everybody Ooh, else yeah. that you and others like you are to keep Ooh. your tongue still <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Well, this hook goes through here yeah. and, and then we're yeah. done. Yeah. So how do you feel now? Well, it's Yeah, well, that's the general idea, I think. So now, with this rope through there, quite literally leads you by the nose. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to happen. What makes it so horrible is that it was the whole community, neighbours you'd have to live with afterwards, who took the punishment into their own hands and let you know what they thought of you. That makes him dizzy. Dizzy all the time. Oh. Uh oh. Oh well. Okay, I'll take over from here. Oh. Oh. Dizzy all the time. Pouring the fizzle. Ooh. God, so you're pouring with. Dribble. How do you feel about scolding now? Oh God! I tell you, it just makes you so irritable. Yeah. These guys are dragging you along, and this thing's jerking on you all the time. They were shoving me all the time. I'm just wanting to deck them, but this thing here, sorry, it's fairly disgusting now. It's sort of pressing down on your tongue and 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 jamming in, and it d depends really on how taut this rope is as to how much pain you're in. Actually, oh, I've just dropped this thing you can you know, get rid of that for a start it's so irritating I can't well, this is you. what got you into trouble in the first place this attitude <laughs> it doubles it it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't stop it mate I want to fight anybody <laughs> all of you <laughs> horrible ah. We don't know how many fishwives were punished. Records only name offenders as wives, the property of men. But we do know that while Elizabeth I was on the throne, these punishments were stepped up in number and severity. For me, the worst was yet to come. We now come to what's got to be the worst part of the worst job in the Tudor period. If the skull's bridle hadn't worked and I was as disruptive as ever, then there was another punishment that they could use, which seems to me to be infinitely worse. We've got half a dozen fierce-looking blokes here and this long metal pole and this pivot in the middle. It's a ducking stool. Was this an old form of punishment? Yeah, the ducking stool dates back to Norman times and you'd have had one of these in most communities and the idea was that uh, all sorts of antisocial men and women uh, would be ducked. But by Tudor times, it's a punishment specifically for a scolding woman like yourself. Well, surely there weren't more stroppy women in the Tudor period than any other period. Well, there's definitely a sense that oh, people are thanks. more obsessed with order by the Tudor period, yeah. and that often in communities, women were particularly the focus of that. Why this particular punishment? Well, the idea is that you'd be ducked in the water, and this will cool your hot tongue and yep. uh, tame your unruly ways and that the whole village will turn out to watch this happening to you. 
So there really would have been this many people here? Oh yeah, you wow. wouldn't have missed this for the world in Tudor times. This was a big day out for everybody. I'd miss it for the world when they hit that tree. Oh. How are you feeling now? Silly question. Ever the scold? Well, I've got nothing to lose now, have I? How do you feel now? Oh, freezing! Ah. 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 Oh. oh, it's so cold! Oh. Oh. That's the coldest I've ever been. I surrender. You feel corrected? Yeah, I'm absolutely corrected. Oh, can you get this belt off me? Oh. Oh. I'll be demure. I'm quiet and well behaved forever from now on. Right, we'll hold you to that. <sighs> Actually, I probably won't. Women sometimes died under this mob justice. Even in these controlled conditions, I was powerless under the momentum. And for those few seconds, experience the fear a Tudor woman must have felt. That was deeply unpleasant, but there's plenty more to come. Next time I'll be trawling round the lower reaches of the job market again as we look at some of the worst jobs in Stuart times. There were the men who were the cabbies of the 17th century, the messy reality behind Guy Fawkes, and try swallowing this for a living. Stay tuned next hour for another episode of The Worst Jobs in History.